The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Among those who went up to worship at the festival, some were Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip and Andrew went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered him, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The person who loves their life loses it, and the person who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we are so blessed to be on this side of that statement. That covenant was struck when Jesus Christ was crucified, died and was buried, descended into hell, and rose again on the third day. Why do we read Jeremiah today? Why do we need to hear these words today? What is the secret in this psalm? A little background on Jeremiah. He was the prophet who foretold the fall of Israel into the Babylonian hands. And he told it to the king. He told them what idols they were worshiping. Their acts of immorality would be their undoing. The king, Jehoiakim, didn't change his ways. And Israel fell to the Babylonian king. Jeremiah remained behind in Israel during the exile with the remnants of the people. And he sent letters to the exiles to encourage them to persevere in their faithfulness to God during their exile in Babylon. Jeremiah's letter to Babylon reminds us that even though we have deeply sinned and separated ourselves from God, we have hope and we believe in God's merciful love and forgiveness. It is a call for our reconciliation and transformation. As we draw near to Easter, this psalm today becomes a mindful prayer throughout our Lenten observance that we have been seeking a clean heart. Jesus' death and resurrection established a new covenant with us. By our baptism, we have been saved from original sin. And as we live our lives, we will sin. It's a fact. We are in the process of conversion to become brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, and we will make mistakes. We actively turn to God in reconciliation and pray to Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, to intercede for us. Why do we have to name our sins? If God knows everything, he certainly knows what I've done. Why do I have to say it? Give Father Mark leverage over me? If that were true, I'd be already washing his car every week. That's just for my language. Seriously, 
Just as prayers, almsgiving, and fasting are physical acts that we give our egos something to do while the Holy Spirit chisels away at our stony hearts, reconciliation is also a physical act of surrendering, but with a spiritual component. Since it's a sacrament, it's a special presence and a closeness to the Holy Spirit that we enjoy, and it restores us to the sinless state we received at our baptism. Father isn't just a priest in this moment, but persona Christi. He's acting in the person of Christ. This is what he was configured for at his ordination. Just as Jesus told the man with the mat his sins were forgiven, Jesus is telling us that our sins are forgiven through Father Mark. Trust me, God already knows what we did and what we will do, and he will run joyfully out to meet us because he spotted us from a long way off when we turn to come to reconciliation. It's not the sin he's interested in, it's our hearts. God is love and only love. He doesn't get hung up on sin like we do. Our free will gives us the ability to turn away from God. Sin turns us from God. And when we turn to God, he effortlessly brushes our sins aside to embrace us and lovingly welcome us back into his arms. It's his action that brings us back. And for God, it's as easy as putting the petals back on a rose. It's only something he can do. I said res uh, reconciliation was a physical act of surrendering, but what are we surrendering? Our sovereignty. We are acknowledging our createdness. We are created in the likeness and image of God. We are created. We are not gods. We acknowledge that we have autonomy and free will and possessions, but they are all pure gift from God. So, in spite of our egos, in the face of our egos, we turn to God and acknowledge that God is God and we are not. Jesus said, just as a grain of wheat will remain a grain of wheat unless it dies, this made me ask a question. Am, am I the grain of wheat or is Jesus the grain of wheat? I'm a nerd, if those of you didn't already know that, and admittedly, I ask a lot of questions and I know all kinds of useless information. So I was a bit surprised when this floated to the surface and revealed itself as useful. Did you know the oldest grain that has been discovered from an archeological dig is from a village over 11,100 years ago? It's astonishingly old. I know, but it's still just grain. What's more astonishing is if we think about a single one of those grains, if it was planted 11,000 years ago, and it yielded only two grains, and each of those two grains was planted and they yielded two grains, and we repeat this, in a little over a thousand years, we would have an uncountable amount of grain. It's a nine with 308 zeros behind it. I said I was a nerd, I did the math. And that's only 10% of the 11,000 years. But the secret is, each generation died to itself so that the next could produce. I can hear us being called. Throughout our lives, we will die to ourselves at different times and more than once. And I'll give you an example. If you were married, you've died to single life to take up married life. If you're a parent, you've died to independence to raise a child. If you're a student who's living away from home, you've died to the dependence on your family to take up independence. And the list goes on. This dying happens for everyone the baptized and the unbaptized. If we do not acknowledge that God is God and we are not, we will remain as we've created ourselves to be, even with those other types of dying. 
I want you to picture the hard shell on the outside of that seed protecting it from growing. The dying that Jesus is talking about and did for us is the taking control of our lives from our egos and placing it in his hands. A death to our all-important, demanding, selfish egos and a rising to a selfless love of the other, as Jesus did. We are called to become Jesus for one another so that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Reconciliation is a dying to our selfish ego selves to reveal the true selves God has created and loves, the one in the image of his son. But we cannot do it on our own. We turn to God for whom nothing is impossible. Jesus gives us himself to eat, to feed us and nourish us with his body and blood. But we do not turn him into our flesh and bone. He is the yeast that mixes in us and raises us up. As we approach the Eucharist, let us turn to God in our need so that he may remake us into what we were created to be, the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. <laughs>